Hello everybody. I chose to come on to the scene this way uh, for the dramatic effect of the window that you see behind me. It's uh, a new window and it's of course not even a window really at all. What I did was go out on my terrace and take a photograph of the scene just outside the house. If there were a window, if it were pointing that way, then this is what you would be seeing. Minus, of course, the sunflowers, because this is no longer springtime or early summer. And uh, what you'll have with this is a window with sunflowers all the year round. Anyway, um, I thought it would be a little prettier than, than uh, just a white wall. And so I, I blew up that picture to a meter by about a meter and a half or more. And then put a frame around it and uh, made it look like a window. So imagine, and it's not much of an imagination because in fact this is more or less what you would see if you were here and looking in the right direction uh, and through an opening. But if you were standing, for example, out on my terrace where I can't really record because of the sounds of traffic which are very dim, airplanes which are more so wind on the microphone which would be the most, um, the biggest distraction. Anyway, I wanted to uh, say that uh, I've been wishing to do this video for a, a little while and I couldn't, first of all, because for nearly five weeks now my throat has been just uh, inflamed all the way down into my chest and I could hardly do anything but croak at you, as you heard on the talk. Davy told me that there was a lot of static on that uh, telephone recording and she assured me it wasn't my voice, but I thought, well, my voice certainly contributed to the effect of static because I could only sort of croak. And uh, then there's been the most amazing rain. The biggest, heaviest cascade of rain in 50 years is what someone said. So anyway, here I am doing something that I hope to do once a month to send to you. And today we've been talking about sort of seminal things, important things, and uh, I want to talk further on that subject. I want to tie it into the subject of creativity because I talked about our wanting to be creative, but in the line that Master has given us, and that if we can keep developing in that direction, then we will be really serving Master. And I remembered many years ago, I was very new at Mount Washington at the time, and Gene Haupt, who was an older man, 55, it seemed ancient to me at the time, and uh, he was the gardener, and or at least he did some gardening, and he was sort of wishing that he could uh, express his creativity in the garden and I thought well that's a good idea. It seemed like anytime anybody wanted to get some word to master they would ask me to do it. I don't know why. Maybe they saw me as the kind of person who sticks his neck out. Anyway I talked to master about it and I was really surprised by master's answer. He said talk to Virginia she knows my wishes for the garden. Well, I was young, I was American, and I was very much uh, into personal freedom, although I had given that freedom to Master. But my first instinctive thought was, well, gee, can't we even be creative in the garden? Oh, what has that got to do with his teachings? And then I thought, because I, my main purpose in being there was discipleship, and so I immediately thought, well, what does it matter? If this is important to him, then that makes it important to me. And so I didn't argue with him, I didn't grumble, and I didn't feel badly about it. But I do remember that first flash that came into my mind of, uh, can't we be creative too? Can't we do it our way also? Uh, does everything have to reflect him? And it's over the years that I've come to understand what he meant and how wise he was. My wisdom at that time lay in accepting his word because he had given it, accepting his advice because he had given it, not because I understood. I just assumed that the understanding 
would come. Well, just about that time, or maybe just a little bit later, there was a kind of committee that was started, and they were, I think Master appointed the committee to see what would happen. And they were beginning to sort of uh, complain about all the things that weren't right that needed to be fixed. And up to a certain point, I'm sure they were right. Master himself said later, I could start talking about the faults of this organization and never stop. But the thing is that there is basically good there, and uh, why not emphasize that good? But anyway, it was then that I saw that these people were uh, getting out of tune with Master, and that lack of attunement was far more important than the rightness or the wrongness of their ideas. And so I pulled back from uh, their discussions, and uh, it was just about then that Master began telling me, you have a great work to do. And I understood th what he meant in, in saying that, at least to this extent, that he saw that I was one who would try to do his will and not do what uh, was natural for a young creative male and natural for an awful lot of Americans and unfortunately, natu unfortunately natural for a lot of disciples. But then they aren't real disciples, they're students. I've come to understand over the years, and this has been my practice now for just about the whole time that I've been Master's Disciple, that if I want to know how to do something, if I want to know uh, what is the right course of action, I always, always, if I'm not sure already, if I don't know already, I always ask myself, not just as what does Master want, to that question, there are all kinds of possible answers depending on your own desire. Sort of, what do you want, Master, but you really want this, don't you? Huh? 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 That, that's not the right way. But I ask myself, what would Master do? What would Master say? What would Master think? How would Master view these things? I've meditated on his life. From that point of view, I've tried to understand why he did and said what he did. And even that little garden episode, I've come to understand that he was talking on a much deeper level. It wasn't at all, and I doubt very much that he even talked to the disciple to tell her where he wanted flowers. But he wanted us to do everything with the thought of attunement, so that we are doing it as devotees and not just as workers. Jean Haupt, who first raised that complaint, finally left Mount Washington, grumbled, I didn't come here to rake leaves. And Master, when he heard that, he said, I didn't ask him to rake leaves. He said he was like a merchant. I've given you so many kriyas, now you've got to give me so much realization. He said, God doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, care for that kind of attitude. And so Jean, with that sense of uh, wanting to do it his way, and I think that's what he was really talking about, and not just the raking of leaves, didn't understand that there is joy in raking leaves if that's what the guru wants and if that's what you offer to the guru, and then the guru begins to give you more and more. It's not as if by trying to do the guru's will, your creativity is squashed or suppressed. Actually, when I was younger and hadn't yet come to master my desire was to be a writer, but I wanted to write something meaningful. Now, if I'd only wanted to be a writer, I could have been a reporter. I could have just put any old thoughts on the page, but I wanted them also to be true. And this was the freezing point for me. I just couldn't come up with truth that was deep enough because I didn't know truth myself. And it took quite a while being with Master. At first, I didn't really get to write very much, but I did do some. I wrote The Jewel in the Lotus, which I rewrote many years later, but the beginning and the essence of it was there. It's only the first part that I added later. I wrote stories of Mukunda, so yes, I, I was able to be creative too. Most of my creativity seemed to go in the direction of uh, writing brochures and pamphlets for the church, like Why a Church of All Religions, and. Um, 
uh, oh, I forget the name of that thing, but they still use it for uh, interesting people in uh, the monastic life and uh, so on. Um, I know the name too, but it just slips my mind at the moment. And then gradually over the years, and I, I would never have been allowed to be creative in this way if I'd stayed with SRF, but Master gave me the freedom to be able to create. But all my work in music, writing, Ananda, everything, every note, every thought, I always have, usually in the front of my mind, if not, then at least in the back of my mind, is this what Master would do? Is this what Master would say? And far from impeding my creativity, I find that I've really begun to be creative uh, since I began to develop that attitude. That creativity also requires a channel. It's, 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 an, it's an interesting thing, you know, all my slideshows were taken, first I took the slides, then on the basis of the slides, I was able to write the dialogue, create a storyline, and so on, and I didn't use all the slides, but I chose those that would help to uh, bring about a storyline. And the, what I'm saying then is that I had a fixed concrete thing to follow, and that enabled me to be creative. Many times people will ask me to write something and I say, well, I'm really too busy to think about it, but if you'll write something, then I can work on what you've written. And I warn them in advance, I probably won't keep any of it. And usually I don't. But uh, what they give me is something concrete. And as soon as I have something concrete in my hands, then I can begin to think about it, think around it, and then come up with what I want. The other way, Yes, I could do it too, but it would be a lot more difficult. It would take a lot more time. You know, on the subject of creativity, I've, I've made a, a study of this because it's interested me, first of all, because we're living in an age when people think that, that uh, no kind of rules ought to be imposed on artists. And uh, uh, some of the most ridiculous, preposterous, obscene art has all been justified in the name of artistic freedom. But when I look back over history, I see that the periods of greatest creativity have been periods when there wasn't that level of artistic freedom, and sometimes periods when it was so drastically curbed that you think people could not be creative. For example, the Muslims, they were not allowed to depict anything, imitate anything in nature. And so they were, because they had creative uh, a flair also, they came up with wonderful geometric shapes. And much of the beauty of Muslim architecture is due to that rigid stricture. And another very interesting point was the 17th century in France, the time of the Précieux, who had very rigid codes of what you could talk about and what you couldn't talk about in the theater. And it became really, you would have thought, artistically suffocating. And finally, Molière managed to sort of knock the whole scene out with ridicule. He wrote a play called Les Précieuses Ridicules, which means the ridiculous Précieuses. And yet, while it was at its height, it produced the greatest drama that France has ever produced. Plays by, by Molière, yes, the comedian, also Corneille, Racine. Uh, these were great plays. And it's as if having a framework within, 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 within which to operate gave them that focus and that clarity that then made it possible for them to open up into uh, the great creativity that came. Now Shakespeare had a certain stricture there in writing iambic pentameter, but look what he did with it. Look at the sonnets with their very rigid rules, and yet those sonnets are just incredibly beautiful. And uh, um, there's just one sense that, uh, that uh, came to my mind. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. 
Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark. And so he goes on. I don't remember the, the uh, whole poem, but it's a beautiful poem. And yet when you come to the free verse of, of uh, um, well, Walt Whitman springs to mind because he's written some beautiful verse too. But it's also sort of like a, a, a garden that's overgrown with weeds. It sort of spews off in all directions and there would have been more beauty for control. But because Walt Whitman did write beautifully, because I myself love his poetry and because he may be a favorite of yours, I don't offer that as my best example. The others are good examples. And I think that in this century, where there have been virtually no rules, there's also been virtually no art. Art is really a, a blasphemy today, whether it be music, poetry, painting, sculpture, uh, it, it's just, uh, uh, it's embarrassing. And I think that a hundred years from now, people will look back and all they'll say is, well, those people had problems. Whereas art really ought to offer solutions, not just problems. Anyway, my main point is that by trying to attune ourselves to that extent with Master, to ask ourselves always, what would he want? is not restricting, although it seemed restricting also to me in a sense, although I dropped that thought, but it seems restricting. It seemed restricting to those creative people at Mount Washington who left in disgust and returned to a worldly life. It didn't help them. Whereas I have found that by trying to stay with his message, I have found that my creativity just doesn't know any bounds. I could go on forever. I don't think I, I will. I, I don't even want to. I think I've done what I needed to in most of the things that I've done. I still have a few little projects to do. But uh, the point is, as I said in my addendum to the 50th anniversary video, that uh, um, what was I about to say? Uh, I was talking about the the um, well, gosh, it slipped my mind right now. But the importance of uh, doing everything uh, in line with what Master taught and did. And then I said that we need to think of this as sort of a genealogical chart. That what he did, I've taken and tried to offer in many different ways. and the best thing would be for you as a part of this particular branch of the genealogical chart would be to work with that. And that's, again, I said it, uh, I've written seminally and even my music is seminal with the thought that from that basic center and simplicity that many, many things can be explored in, in education, in literature, in music, in all sorts of ways. And to try to bypass that because you want to do your own creativity um, is certainly something everybody can do. Nobody's going to tell him not to. But it isn't going to make Ananda the powerhouse that it can be. No, it won't. And there's another aspect to that, and it's the same sort of thought that for example, when Maria Warner was living down in Encinitas, she said that somebody put some spices on the shelf in the kitchen in the wrong place. And the cook just got furious and she was shouting, Master didn't do this, Master was very orderly, Master made sure that everything was in its right and proper place and so on. And uh, somebody else that she saw put the uh, things on the mantelpiece in the uh, wrong place and another nun scolded her and said Master wouldn't put up with that and so on. Well, you know, I remember Master coming into the monk kitchen when it was really in total disorder. It was a terrible embarrassment that he would come in at that moment. And maybe I told you this story in the last tape, but he looked around and he said, well, it could be worse. He was generous, almost well, to a degree. And uh, we need to be generous in that same way. But when we uh, think about what would Master do, some disciples would say, 
that uh, well, Master was very strict and very. The, you you hear some stories about Master that that just don't sound like the Master I knew at all. And yes, he could be stern, but he only disciplined people if they asked for it. As you saw also in the autobiography of a yogi, that uh, when the the uh, um, when when Master was saying, "What am I going to do with a guru who can read my every thought?" And Sri Yukteswar said, you have given me that right. If you don't want it, I won't do it anymore. Master said, of course, I want to be corrected. And that was the attitude of a true disciple. But um, the, the, uh, there are so many ways that, that you could read what Master did. And if you listen to some people, you might end up getting a picture of Master that would not be uh, very magnetic to people. And yet it might be true to certain aspects of what he did. He did scold people, but as I said, he only scolded those people who had asked for, uh, for discipline. And uh, he was not a, a harsh person at all. He could speak strongly, that's very different, but you looked into his eyes and you saw only regret that he had to talk like that. And so when people try to think, what would Master do? They might indeed come up with some goofy ideas. And that's why it's always a help to look at those people whom you have chosen as his examples. I am your prime example that way because I knew Master. And I can say, no, he wouldn't have done that. And I can say it with a certain amount of conviction. And uh, so if you don't know what Master would do, it certainly would help you to think, well, uh, would Swami do this? Now, it isn't that everything I do is what I feel Master would do. Some things which I feel are trivial, I would uh, not bother to ask would he do it because I know he would say no. For example, drinking coffee. Uh, I don't suppose he would take it very seriously, but he did say we shouldn't drink coffee and I happen to like coffee. I think it's a lot better than that. that uh, supposed tea that you, you uh, get from health food stores, uh, which I can drink one or two cups and then I get sick of it. So, okay, these days I'm not drinking coffee and I'm sure some of you will heave a great sigh of relief and think, wonderful, maybe he's on the bandwagon at last. But my uh, serious point here is that uh, what I, when I act on behalf of Master consciously, when I try to do what Master wants, then I'm more likely to be right than other people are because I knew him. I'm more likely to know what he was like than others. So it doesn't hurt to see, well, what would Swami do if I don't know what Master would do? But what I would say first is, think what Master would do because your own common sense would tell you too. And besides, your attunement with him would help to push you in that direction. If further in doubt, then say, well, what would Swami do? Further advantage there is to ask me. And then if you don't even know or can't reach me, then ask what others would do who are in tune with this path. Because we have a lot of them at Ananda. And they, I have been so thrilled really in living here and therefore not being directly involved, being away in Italy. So thrilled to see how many of the decisions people in positions of authority and responsibility, and those two are not necessarily always the same thing, but how many times they are just what I would have wanted to do, and just what I would have felt Master wanted to do. This is how we can be the most creative, by getting behind a, an energy that has been launched and helping to push it outward to other people until it reaches thousands. But to shortcut that, to go around a sort of an end run and uh, try not to get tackled by this end run and decide to do uh, one's own creativity, well, the f plain fact is you can't live in a vacuum. You're going to be drawing from some other source of inspiration. You're not going to just create your own inspiration. This is the plain fact of it. You're going to be doing uh, songs similar to what have been sung in the media, in the, on the radio, in the television, in the uh, bands, and uh, whatever, 
that you've heard on records. Uh, it's inevitable. I, I couldn't do it. I draw on Master. Even my music, which isn't music he wrote, I still ask in, in writing it, is this note in tune with what uh, you're trying to express? And every note to me is important I in that way. So I would like to urge you, and I've been talking seminally about things that I think are, are very, very necessary to our growth uh, and our development. I, I think that it's so easy for elements to come in and say, well, we want a creative too, and then go and take it in a completely different direction. I, I think that uh, Ananda will simply fail. Yes, it could draw thousands. That's still failure if it doesn't keep the spirit. I'd rather have two people and with the spirit than hundreds that don't have that spirit. Don't think in terms of numbers. Don't think in terms of how many people like something. Ask yourself, is this really furthering our mission? The suggestion was raised recently that we put on a festival and attract, invite different religious groups, churches and so on to come and do theatrical pieces. And this is so, um, it's so far from what I was trying to say in the Hindu way of awakening, because it's presenting the differences. Those churches aren't going to, if they read my book, if they try to get in tune with this teaching years down the line, they may begin to understand what I mean by the way of awakening, what Master meant by the way of awakening. What we'll have otherwise is just the usual hodgepodge. It will be just a, a, a clamor of different voices saying, this is what we believe now, this is what we believe. And just like that, that uh, uh, big congress of all religions in Calcutta in 1960, where everybody took the opportunity to get up and say uh, his thing. And the bishop of the Catholic bishop in Calcutta said, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak about my Lord Jesus Christ. And others got up to t talk about how their way was the best. And uh, when I got up to speak, I said, it seems to me that what we're here to do is talk about those aspects of religion that unite us, not those aspects which separate us. And everybody afterwards, not everybody, there were thousands of people there, but a lot of people came up to me afterwards and said, oh, what a great idea. And I, I thought, to call this a great idea when it's this obvious is almost worse than, than uh, I'd hoped. Because it's too obvious. Everybody should have understood it from the start. We are, uh, we need to talk about the similarities, to put on plays by different religions, to put on things that talk about the outward aspect of things rather than Master's inner explanation um, for example, we could put on a show of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam and have somebody come out with a hookah and a uh, turban and a long flowing galabiya, and uh, we could uh, uh, talk about what life was like back then in the 13th century. What would that have to do with Omar Khayyam, who lived in eternity? We need to get back to our thoughts of discipleship. We are here for a particular mission, and if we can serve Master in that way, I think he will then, at the end of our lives, say, well done. I hope he'll say it to all of us, because this life is so temporary, and whatever we do in this life has absolutely no meaning. You know, when I look back on all the work that I've done, and I've had so many compliments, and People tell me how great it is, and I say, God is the doer, and they say, well, yes, but God needs a channel. And uh, I just refuse to buy that answer. Yes, he needs a channel. Yes, I did it. Okay. But so what? It's not important. The question that God is going to ask me when I die, or is asking me right now, is not, what have you done? 
or what have you done for me, it will be and is, do you love me? Our love for God is the only thing that matters. And our attempt to please matter, Master will be based not on what we've done, but on the devotion with which we've done it. And position, success, triumph, these don't mean anything. You know, people are wrong most of the time anyway, so why should they suddenly be right if they praise you? I would say, wait for that smile of God and Guru in your heart. When you have that, then you know that whatever you do, it will be right. There was this man in England, the Dean of the Church of England, and he was in a panel discussion with me and a few other people. And he was on just before me and he was shouting about all the things we've got to do for social uplift. And when I got up, I said, if God told me, or if I felt inspired by God to rake leaves in the park, I'd do that. That would be my service. It isn't what we do, it's the spirit with which we do it. And otherwise you can, you can do all kinds of work in this world and it's just like shuffling and reshuffling the same deck. We have to bring a new energy and that can only come through inspiration and that inspiration can only come from God. And it will come from God only through Guru and our line. So let's live in the thought of uh, closeness to Master. I'm going to show you a little something, because I'm playing with a new recorder here. And uh, you see how I can come in close with it? It's, I'm going to look over at the screen there, because it's a large screen. It really looks real, doesn't it? That's another thing that I've noticed, is that people um, have certain dogmas. For example, for years, people insisted you couldn't blow up a little 35 millimeter uh, slide into a decent picture. And I said, look, Gen uh, uh, National Geographic does it, or oh, it can't be done. I said, it's been done. They said, it can't be done. So I, I get fed up with that kind of argument, and I, I sort of feel that too much technology can be a curse. This picture, which really looks pretty good, I took it not just from my porch with a 35 millimeter camera, but with a cheap camera. And still, look how it, well it enlarges. Don't get too technical in the work that you do. Don't get too technological. Remember that the most important ingredient in any stew that you cook up will be love. Love God. Love Guru. Love your own highest potential for joy.